and assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the live feed of, uh, my name is Shamayz Rashid and I have great pleasure in introducing to you a wonderful event this week, evening and it's part of the Homebird, Homebound Art in Isolation series, The Unwritten Futures. Today's event is uh, celebrating poetry, photography, film, animation and conversation. We've got, we're gonna be joined by a tremendous number of guests, cross-cultural, cross-generational, sharing with you their thoughts on unwritten futures and what that actually means. Hopefully our viewers who are joining us today are not just local, national, but also international as well. And so are some of our guests. Um, as promised, today's event is quite thought provoking. I hope it uh, inspires you lifts you and makes you think about the future positively. The topic of today's event is all about moving forward from the current pandemic and how we look towards the future and what changes are required to make life better for all of us. What cultural practices will be continuing and what will we do differently? And how have we adapted to the pandemic and what new practices have we embraced? Now we've all had individual experiences of this. In today's event, we're asking our spoken word artists, our filmmakers, photographers, to share with us their experiences and their thoughts on how, what does the unwritten future hold for us? Without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce our first guest who is no other than somebody who had great knowledge of knowing. I've had a great experience of seeing her perform. She's somebody that really lifts my spirits with her words. She's based in Luton. Um, she's a soul-based coach, an author and performance poet who's passionate about exploring relationships, spirituality, race and social justice. It's no other than the very delightful Hanifa Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum Hanifa. Walaikum salam. Yes, I've taken myself off mute now. <laughs> Walaikum salam, Shabazz, and uh, good evening, everyone. And it's such a pleasure to be here um, with this panel, this group of, uh, of wonderful people, wonderful artists. And I know we have a packed schedule and you're going to want to hear from everyone here. And um, I hadn't expected to be first on the bill, but that's okay because then it means I can just sit back, do my thing, and then sit back and enjoy everyone else and theirs. And I, I um, as Shemiza says, I'm a spoken word poet. And so I've written something on the theme of unwritten future. And whether or I, I'm hoping um, that even no matter what effect it has on you, I'm hoping that it will help us all to think about where we where we've come from, where we are now, and about where we're going. It may be said, it could be said that my my word, my my piece, the piece that I'm going to deliver um, is a, a bit doom and gloomy. It's not meant to be. It's just meant to be thought provoking because I don't necessarily do the nicey nicey all the time. I am quite um, I can be quite thought provoking, um, but let's see how we go. So my piece today is called Unwritten Future. There are many tales, well-known stories of past battles, victories, ancient glories, civilizations that existed before us, images, signs, symbols of gods they loved. History is littered with heroes and those claiming to come in peace, but instead they chose to seize people's lands using lies and with stealth they were intent on suppression and building their own wealth. No words can express the impact of their wicked deeds. Their actions are the cause of our generational grief. So today, we're here living with our trauma and our pain, fighting the same enemy, the same tactics, but just under a different name. Like the enemy who crept up on us with empty promises and gifts, 
In the 1950s and 60s, black people were invited to come with their British citizenship. They wanted to help rebuild the motherland and they left their countries willingly. When they came, they expected a welcome, but instead they got hatred and hostility. In 1968, Enoch Powell made his infamous Rivers of Blood speech. It caused a massive storm because he created a vision of Britain under siege from waves of immigrants flooding in, stealing their jobs and houses and their women. From white people born and bred here, they said the ordinary Englishman. In the UK, black and Asian people faced dis discrimination in all areas of daily life. So laws like the Race Relations Act 76 were introduced giving every person the right to receive fair treatment with equality and without exclusion. The right to have good jobs, homes, health, and for their children to have a proper education. In the 1980s and 1990s, the language of equality changed to inclusion and diversity, and there were some other names, they were cleverly introduced so that the politicians could make it seem like suddenly we could all believe in a new colorblind dream. But that was another con, to make black and brown people feel that we were accepted. While secret decisions were taken that meant our status as citizens was going to be rejected. It resulted in black people, the Windrush generation, being forced to leave. When the Tories introduced its blatantly racist, hostile environment policy. At the time, the government threw up its hands and apologized for its mistake. But frankly, I don't buy it. Their weak words are like crocodile tears, just fake. They had a plan. And they knew back then exactly what they wanted to achieve. Though it looks like it backfired. <laughs> I'm sure they've got something else up their sleeve. Today, in 2020, black people and others still face brutality and racist attacks. In sport, in health, the law, in schools and at work. We're always watching our backs. We're still being beaten, harassed, and even killed for the whole world to see. So we're still forced to insist that Black Lives Matters when all we ask is to be treated fairly. You know, this world is in such a messed up state politically, financially, and in all kinds of ways. Governments not governing, health service sick, and many people say they've lost their faith. Now COVID has arrived and we're distanced from work and family and friends. Each day feels more uncertain. And we ask each other, when? Will life be normal again? But what's normal? There is no normal. We only know what's gone before. Our yesterday is past. Today will soon be gone. It will be no more. And we're not promised a life tomorrow. No guarantees have ever been given. So instead, we must wait for our fate to be revealed as the future is unwritten. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Hanifa. What an absolutely poignant piece, which has actually helped start kick off this fabulous event. Hanifa, you've spoken so, with such depth and with such truth but I wanted to ask you your own personal experience. 
How has the pandemic impacted your artistic practice? And where do you see the future or this new, new normal post pandemic for an artist like yourself of black heritage? Thank you for asking that. Uh, and, I'll answer, and I'll answer quite briefly, Shemaiza. I'll, I'll say that initially I felt um, I felt I wondered if I would actually write right again because I, I I got caught up in the whole oh woe is me woe is me oh isn't this terrible this is all oh, this world is never going to be the same again and this is my life has changed blah, blah, blah. but I began to as I sat down I, I I kind of got over myself had a chat to myself got over myself and realized that this is a fantastic space it's a space lockdown is a chance to open up myself to this changed reality uh -huh. and uh, using the the thing one of the things that interests me most words writing I could actually be more creative and the moment I opened myself up to a greater creativity within myself and around me, I began writing. So I've, I've been writing furiously and I've been involved in a, in a few projects and so exciting. So in terms of my, my, my craft, my writing, that's, it's, been, it's been a wonderful opportunity in many ways. Difficult, yeah, no doubt at all, difficult. But um, the challenge is, if you like, I've, I've decided I'm gonna step up to them and meet them and as far as I can, overcome them. You mentioned community, Hanifa. The BAME community has been greatly impacted in COVID and by COVID because of the multi-generational households, um, the, the economic and digital deprivation that's come from this, and also the feeling of isolation. So post COVID, do you think there is going to be any sign of improvement in the way the BAME community has been impacted by COVID? Mm -hmm. Do you know, um, I, the first thing I have to say, I, I mean, I know you use the phrase BAME and I try to get away from these BAME and, uh, and, and POC and all of the people of color BAME and all this stuff, but I respect what you say. So I won't use that. I'll just say, you know, pe black people, brown people, people of other, ethnic groups, cultural groups, whatever. I think we will have learned a lot from this experience. You can't not learn from this experience. You can't, we can't not have learned something from this experience, either in terms of how we live together as a community um, or how we can make an impact on society by being part and parcel of larger institutions and organizations. Um, working to change laws, um, whatever it may be. So I don't think we can, uh, as, as, as communities, I don't think we can have failed to have, to, to have seen opportunities to make change. I myself have observed, I must say, I have, I've observed, um, for instance, more people of the African, Caribbean, Asian and other communities um, in the media these days. Now, I don't know if that's because we are saying on the sidelines, we want more of a representation. I don't know if that's what's being said. In education, I have friends who are teachers in education, they are saying, look, we are dem demanding better representation in the staffing groups, um, uh, uh, it, you know, wherever they may be. So I think in our communities, there is much more of a demand for better, uh, a better reflection of our us out there in the wider community. And I, I think that comes as a result of us as, as people in our communities saying, yeah, we can, we need to step up. So I want to kind of uh, introduce my next guest with loads of excitement actually, because I'm an absolute fan of my next guest. He's an iconic photographer who's actually made his name um, all over the world with some of the most beautiful photography um, imaginable. I'm speaking about no other than the very respected, iconic British photographer, Peter Sanders, who's joining us this evening today to share with us a presentation on diversity and unwritten future. 
Now, Peter Sanders' work is, uh, focuses on Muslim community around the world and especially on their traditional and spiritual aspects. And he's had more than four decades of experience in photography. He's one of the most renowned and respected Muslim photographers in the world. So it's an absolute pleasure to have Peter Sanders join us this evening as part of the Unwritten Future event. Assalamu alaikum, Peter. Alaikum salam. Nice to meet you again. Thank you so very much for joining us, Peter. Um, I am a little bit excited because I'm a big fan of your work and it's given me lots of peace. In, the, in these testing times to kind of observe the beautiful photography that you've shared. But today um, we're going to be sharing your work through a presentation which explores diversity, something that uh, uh, you're very, very popular in, uh, in sharing to many, not just across Britain, but the world as well through your photography. So tell us a little bit more about this presentation that we're going to be seeing very shortly. Um. It's called Unity Through Diversity, and it was something I had an idea about quite some time ago. And then um, I started thinking about what's been happening the last year, and I, I suddenly saw the, the deeper side to this presentation. But uh, it was such an old, it was made such a long time ago, I had to rebuild the whole thing from scratch and rescan all the images and everything. So it's like a new version of it now. Um, it, it approaches two things which I think are quite important. One is unity through diversity and uh, that's you know very much present at this time but it also uh, addresses death which is the big unspoken thing that everybody the pandemic has sort of brought to the surface that people are very feared about very scared of death you know because it's an unknown thing but I mean no one's exempt from it and it's something we need to understand and you know, uh, appreciate the process. So it's uh, so it addresses those two things really. Hopefully, it speaks for itself. And we're looking forward to seeing it very shortly. Thank you so very much for sharing with us um, a little bit about this presentation. Um, before we go to see the presentation, I just want to quickly ask you, Peter, how has COVID been for you? Um, well, it's sort of strange because of, um, last December I decided I've been traveling for so much for sort of for 50 years and it was time to sit still and um, get down to doing some proper work, you know, so, uh, so I decided I was going to stop traveling and, uh, and then, you know, COVID happened and I'd already been sitting still for three months, so I thought, oh, we'll just carry on then and just continued sitting still and working. My last book took me 50 years. I've done the next book in about six weeks. So it's been a very productive time for me, so. MashaAllah. So we'll be putting the pre presentation for our viewers to see yes. uh, in a few moments time. Folks, if you've just joined in um, on the Facebook live feed, you are watching myself, Shamiz Rashid. I'm joined by an absolutely wonderful panel of guests today who are nationally and internationally renowned, who are joining today to have conversations around how, change, what sort of future are we looking towards in this in the current pandemic? And where what cultural practices will may possibly change and continue? Um, today's event, we're joined by not, uh, not only the amazing Peter Sanders, but we're also going to be joined by young people from a local school. We're also joined by two, three amazing filmmakers and animators and a musician as well with African uh, heritage. So lots to look forward to today. Um, I just want to uh, come back to uh, Peter and just um, ask him, Apart from the photography work that you've been doing, Peter, did you pick up any other hobby whilst in lockdown? Um, well, I've kind of, I've always had cats and the trouble with cats is that you never have any wildlife in your garden. So since the last cat, we've um, been nurturing all the wildlife in, in our back, a very small back garden. But in the last few weeks, we've had monk deer and squirrels every day and all different kinds of birds and 
uh, even a water rat and everything. So it's kind of been quite entertaining for us every morning when we have breakfast. <laughs> and did you learn anything about yourself in, isol in isolation? Oh, I yeah. mean, you've been photographing so many subjects around the world, but have you, did you ever have time to kind of just think about you yourself? Um, I did think about what was, what was life going to be without all the traveling that I've been doing. So I just thought I'll just do portraiture, which I've always loved, but I've never really seriously focused on it. I mean, I've, focused, I've done portraits when I've traveled around the world, but to actually do it within a kind of studio setting is what really interests me too. It's kind of challenging because I'm quite a shy person. So, you know, having one-to-one -one with people doing portraiture is quite a, it's quite a intimate and quite a deep thing, you know, and uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to doing that. Mashallah. So observing humanity is something that you've done across different cultures, across the Muslim world. Mm. What have you seen um, regarding Muslims and how they've adapted to COVID and the pandemic, in particular in the UK? I think generally, I mean, I think generally, I mean, I haven't been seeing people like I used to do, but, you know, on, on you know, doing a lot of Zoom sessions and everything. I think generally the, the Muslims have been quite okay with it. I mean, the thing is, it does raise up this issue about fear of death that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. If you are at terms with that, then you have nothing to fear because you know that your life is not in your hands. It's, when you it's leave, quite a poignant is, point. That you've uh, when you meet raised them. there and this is something that you um we're going to be exploring in the powerpoint presentation which has been shared uh, now صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما. Now looking towards the future, the event is called Unwritten Future, so nobody really knows. But if uh, you could foresee the future, how would you want to see the world more united? Well, I mean, the, the future, the unwritten future is huge potential. It's really up to us. You know, mm -hmm. we've made a mess up to up till now, you know. And uh, it's really up to us to those that uh, really believe in, you know, uh, diversity and sharing and a peaceful world. We need to stop these other people from destroying it because they're on the edge of destroying it. And I think this pandemic has given us a chance to really reflect about what future do we want. Not for, not for me, but for our children and our children's children. You know, they're inheriting an incredible mess that's been left behind, all in the in the name of money. Man, you know, these, some people have so much money, they don't know what to do with it all, you know, and then we have these two extremes of people with such poverty. Hello, everyone. My name is Niha. Hi, everyone. My name is Benji. And we are this year's head girl and head boy for Shunnybrook End School. Yes, today we're here to talk to you about unwritten futures and our experiences and thoughts on the subject. So uh, my parents migrated from Sri Lanka when they were very young and settled down here in the UK. And because of this, I was raised in a very strict and cultural way. Uh, in our culture, children are raised to really help their parents, help around the house and give as much as they can towards the family. We're also expected to make huge sacrifices to focus and make the most of our education. Um, our education is taught to be the most important and powerful thing that we have access to and that we should be focusing on. Mm, I think my story is slightly different to that. Um, I think from what I can remember, both my parents migrated to this country in around the year 2000. Um, both of them arriving at various different times, but like Niha, um, my culture uh, has had a massive effect on the upbringing that me and my sister have had. It's led to quite a firm and robust upbringing for the both of us. Um, I think being from a Ghanaian household, uh, we're taught that education is the key to most things in life, mm. especially in moulding and shaping uh, our futures. 
yeah and you know over the last couple years as i've grown up i've realized how immense the journey that my parents have been on is mm. i've realized how difficult it must have been for them to make the transition that they did in a completely foreign country mm. um their future was completely unwritten and yet they still worked hard and got to where they are today you know a successful and comfortable couple mm. they were able to really support their family and mm. i think coming to this realization um has really motivated me to make the most of my education and never take it for granted you know mm. i work my absolute hardest so that you know the future that the pa that my parents have in mind for mm. me it can be accomplished and i can make that come true yeah i think with my side of things i think my mother always liked to say that knowledge is the one thing that once you've got no one can take away from you and i think i've let that stick with me and motivate me to work my hardest as well and wherever i set my mind to and I think in my culture, like Nihar said, uh, we're also expected to make huge sacrifices um, in order to focus on the most of our education and get the most out of our education yeah. as well. I think these sacrifices have and will continue to shape and mould how I view my own future and its uncertainty. Yeah. Um, I think it's difficult to understand or even fully capture what life would be like if things were different. Um, but this is why nothing is ever set in stone. And I think that having an unwritten future is what pushes me to work hard and excel, like I said, yeah. in whatever I set my mind to. So it is nice to see that culture has that sort of effect on me as mm. a person. You know, I always wonder uh, how my future's gonna turn out. I think about how I'm gonna carry my culture and the way I was raised into hopefully a family of my own one day. Mm. And although I'm aware of the traditions and the celebrations that are in my culture, I know nowhere near enough to hopefully be able to pass them on. Um, it's something that I really want to be able to focus on and really educate myself on um, I think carrying the things that I've been taught through my culture will help me to make part of that future a little less unwritten mm. uh, in terms of respect caring for others and focusing on my education as well yeah I think there's almost a beauty in the fact that we don't know where life will lead mm. um, I think one thing my parents have shown me in, and in my culture in general is that we've been given a precious opportunity um, and we've been given all the tools that we needed to succeed yeah. I think always being reminded that some people have and wish that they have a chance that we have is almost comforting the fact that I know that the position I'm in is one in a million yeah. um, in, a, in some sort of aspect and it makes me want to work harder um, mm -hmm. always being reminded that people wish to be where I am yeah. um, and that sort of adds on to the unwritten future sort of aspect like I don't know uh, where my education will take me um, and it's for reasons like that that although I'm anxious about my unwritten, how unwritten my future is I know that whatever the future holds I can be proud of it uh, yeah. when I do get there. I think this year more than any other has proven that we never know what is going to happen. Mm. It's important to remember that you can never be ready for everything that is coming your way. Uh, mm. The future will always be unknown and unwritten. And it's up to us to draw from our morals, our culture and our experiences to support ourselves as much as we can. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, Nina said. I think that with the diverse amount of adapting and resilience we've all had to show this year, uh, it gives me hope that although um, we have this unwritten future we don't know really where it holds whatever it does hold we'll be able to you know rise up to the task and show that sort of resilience that we've been able to show uh, this year um but from my uh, point of view if you are having doubts or are anxious about what the future does hold um feel feel free to take heart and solace in the fact that draw from your culture and draw from other people's culture so that to put your heart, heart at ease um in terms of the uncertainty uh, but yeah, I think that's everything we wanted to cover with you yeah, today, guys. thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So without further ado, I think I need to introduce the absolutely fabulous folk behind this film. They are Sophie Meller. Sophie Meller is joining us today, plus uh, Marcus Roma and uh, Simon Poulter. They are the brains behind this absolutely awesome animation, which is going to be showcased today, exclusively at our event. And um, I think we need to bring them on to the screen and say hello. Um, good evening, folks. Hello, thank you very much for having us. Yes, thank you indeed. Um, Sophie Meller, thank you so very much for joining us. And alongside you, you've got the very fabulous, uh, introduce yourself, is it Simon? Yeah, hello, nice to see Hi, you. Hi, Simon. Um, Simon, uh, you're an artist and creator with, and with a national profile in devising new work with creative technology. And you've worked and, com and commissioned artists and creators with Watershed, Fact and Festival, now Festival, further afield, Knoll West Media Centre and Whitechapel Art Gallery. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. 
um, Simon. And I'm just going to share some information about Sophie. Sophie is an artist. Um, we're going to have your Masab, could you share that information? So Sophie is an artist and a filmmaker. Um, she is a creative technologist. She has been, she has a working practice developing new socially engaged work locally. Sophie, thank you so very much for joining us. And we also are joined by Marcus Roma. Now, Marcus Roma is a nationally acclaimed theatre and film director and has worked as an artistic director and CEO for a range of organisations, including Pilot Theatre and the Theatre Royal Bury St Edmunds. Marcus has a portfolio of projects that span theatre and digital media mediation of new work. So we are in good hands with some very talented filmmakers and animators here too. And um, so uh, Sophie, once again, thank you for joining us. Sophie, tell us a little bit about this film. What's the, what's the plot? Sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Anwar and MKX for commissioning this film. Um, it's been uh, a brilliant thing to work on. Uh, so we were initially um, kind of uh, steer towards the idea of resilience from Anwar when we were thinking about this film and also then moving into the idea of unwritten futures. So obviously, as everyone's been saying tonight, the unwritten future is the unwritten future of our children and our children's children. So we have young people as the starting point in this film, but also bearing in mind we're all responsible for the future, even us older generations. I think the, the overarching theme of the film is um, thinking about the dominant narratives and the dominant voices and how now, now, even more than in the past, it's the time for those voices to be quiet and to listen. So I would say that is what the film is about. It's about the, the dominant narratives just being quiet and listening to what the other voices that are bubbling up very strongly and to listen to what they're saying. That's a really important message, something that we actually take for granted. Actually learning the art of listening is still a new thing for many people. Um, Marcus and Simon are also uh, heavily involved with this film and I wanted to kind of go towards Simon first. Simon, are you a good listener? I am an excellent listener. I, I prefer to listen than to speak, to be honest. <laughs> and um, Marcus, uh, we need to get Marcus on screen. Marcus, your experience in working with young people as part of this film, how engaged were they? Well, really, I want to say that it was written by a, a really extraordinary writer called Inua Ellums, who was born in Nigeria and he's a poet. And he did the Barbershop Chronicles at the National Theatre. And we were wow. really delighted to be able to, um, to be working with him. And we've also worked with, with five young people who are young actors, and one of them is actually from Luton, Amira Fatima. And, we, and basically, these young people, they set up a WhatsApp group, but can they get beyond the hashtag? And can they actually have a more nuanced conversation about what it means and what's important now? And that's what we've been doing. And so we're really proud. There's some people here, for, some of them, it's their very first job. And we've been really delighted to sort of help and to really encourage those young people to have their voice and to also help input into making of this, this piece of work. So once they'd inputted in the process of putting this uh, film together, how have they fared through the process and uh, what have they done since? Well, I think what's interesting is that, you know, we, we got the scripts and then we, we shared it with them and they we, they were recording. But of course, it being locked down, everyone's had to record all of their work on their own mm. or on their phones at home and send the audio in. We were able to get into a studio with one of the actors who's called Sherelle Skeet, who, who played Ron Weasley's sister in the Harry Potter um, West End production for two years. So she's and she's awesome and she plays the lead in it. We managed to get her to a studio uh, with our with our sound composer and, and uh, musician and designer. Um, but essentially everyone was working on their own. So it's been put together and they're going to see this for the first time tonight. It hasn't been seen by anybody. Um, so we're really excited because that's going to be seen by the whole of the uh, of the team of, of five performers and the writer as well. And we're very delighted as Mutiny to have helped being able to shape uh, the words that Inua has written and to then bring that to life with the artwork and animation and film editing of, of Simon and Sophie. Wow, we are very excited, very eager to see this film. Um, thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts just there. Um, 
Ladies talk? and gentlemen, um, today is the exclusive premiere of the film by Mutiny, Mutiny uh, Project. And we are going to be sharing it right now. It's exclusive, it's the first time it's been shared and shown. That warning beforehand, just to say that it's got some age appropriate language that the young people speak. And it's um, that's if it was in cinema, it would have a rating of 13. That's that's the that's the um, that's the breaking news. Thank you. Sorry, beef with my phone. Black Lives Matter. I wasn't hesitating. No glitch. They didn't know it would become a pejorative term for angry, entitled, racist white women. Oh. <laughs> When we arrive, we should draw a line on the ground and write racists on one side, non-racists on the other, in big capital letters, just so people know. Thank you so very much that was one animation and a half really fascinating to kind of go into and dwell into the minds of young people and whatsapp conversations um you've watched it marcus um as we all have i'm sure you've seen parts of it but now as a whole your thoughts on the actual animation well obviously i mean we've been um, so so if we've been working on this for the last um, it's actually six weeks now uh, i'm really proud of it and i think it's, it's just a really interesting piece of work because there's nothing else i've seen that's ever looks like that actually mm. animating a whatsapp conversation or a, a not sap conversation we call it um because we can't other other social media platforms are available I, what i really like about it is the way that in you when i work with in on the script it's a really nuanced conversation about one mm. and actually it really is delving into that and looking at some of those issues and you know and, and connecting with some of those 
um, issues that, you know, in terms of those conversations, it's getting beyond the hashtag and actually having those conversations between a group of people was what anyone wanted to do. It's not something that's, that's sort of binary. It really is about opening up some of those conversations. And I'm, I'm really pleased with the way that the performances have happened and the way that the young actors have really risen to that challenge of working in quite a new way and quite a dislocated way and things then coming together. It was a real, it was very insightful. And it was going into the minds of these young people and the way we work with WhatsApp, which for some can be a friend or other a foe. Um, I want to ask Sophie. Sophie, we talked about the art of listening and the concept of listening. And this is something that uh, you've allowed and encouraged these young people to do. Um, was there anything in particular in their thoughts and the way the young people uh, projected themselves uh, through this animation that surprised you? Well, just because mostly because I haven't worked with actors myself very much uh, in my professional life. I'm just in awe of actors now because obviously we've been listening to their voices over and over again as we edit the film. And just the nuanced uh, performances, the voice only, because obviously they're not physically present whilst they're acting, they're, they're acting with their voices owning. I think they've done so well and, you know, a really different range of, of ways of um, getting their points across and just, just in awe of their acting abilities, really. Um, Simon, Mutiny Films, is it just based around animation or no no it's not um um an interesting thing i mean everybody who's spoken tonight has spoken about the pandemic and the Im uh, impact on their work and i thought um the earlier speakers really spoke to a, a common factor which is that a lot of creative people have actually found themselves being more creative mm -hmm. in the pandemic but mutiny films has kind of specialized in developing projects remotely so Marcus and uh, and ourselves we've worked uh, I think we've done about 13 films this year wow. um, and we've worked with actors all over the UK and mostly as Marcus said these people have actually been working remotely to us mm. so um, one thing I'd like to say is with Anwar, I think we've built up a relationship which has been really interesting because um, when we get commissioned as artists, we don't always uh, get to do more than one thing, but he showed an enormous amount of trust uh, in commissioning us and gave us a lot of uh, free reign and scope to do something. And I think that is quite an unusual thing to do. So um, I think that's what Mutiny is about, is that we really like to work with people with this kind of idea of um, intimacy and trust around the creative making. Now we're moving on to some music. Um, before we leave, move on to the music, I want to say thank you so very much to all our panellists today, our special guests, and you have been special. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your creativity with us this evening. Um, our next guest is uh, a musician, as I've already mentioned. He's a multi-instrumentalist. I need to get that word correct. Somebody that pays, plays a lot of music. Um, he's a musician, a teacher, an actor, a choro player, a drummer. Oh, he can play it all. Um, and uh, he's, he says he's made in Gambia and is Second home is Britain, he, um, and his name is Sunto Suso. Hi everyone, my name is Sunto Suso from The Gambia, a multi-instrumentalist based in the UK. Uh, I'm a griot, griot as we call it, um, jelly back home. Um, griots are historians, um, storytellers, uh, peacemakers, praise singers, poets and musicians um basically all combined in one person a guru uh guru's are important um cultural figures in society um, across west africa who carries their cultural knowledge and identity of the people <laughs>
Thank you very much. Um, I'm on Instagram as well as Suntu Kora Suso. So my name with Kora in between, and uh, my Facebook page is Suntu Suso. Fakoli, Fakoli is spelled as F A K O L I. Thank you very much, and I'm really honored to be here today. And uh, thank you all. Bye bye. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so very much for everybody who's uh, joined us this evening. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It's been an absolute pleasure to be in your company. I want to thank all our fantastic guests, um, our special guest speakers this evening, who were Hanifa Mohammed, also Peter Sanders. We are also joined by um, Marcus Roma, Simon Poulter, Sophie Meller, and Sunto Suso. I want to thank uh, the very fabulous Anwar Qasim for making this event happen. The event was called Art in Isolation. It's a series of events and it's part of the Homebound uh, Art in Isolation series. I just repeated that again. <laughs> but I think you've got uh, the hang of what this event has, all been, has been about. It's been about unwritten futures. The future is bright, let's believe it is, um, and let's remain unified and safe. <laughs>